Hi, I'm Jason Schreiber. Uh, I'm a transportation planner with Nelson Nygaard, a principal out of our Boston office. I lead a lot of our multimodal, downtown, transit-oriented development, parking master planning, campus work, etc. throughout much of the eastern United States and sometimes places overseas. Um, and I, you know, I'd like to think that one of the reasons Tim asked me is because of what I've learned in my 20 plus years doing this over and over again, which is that no two places are alike, but one common thread exists in any transportation work that I've done, which is that it isn't actually at all about the transportation. It is entirely about the places that we're trying to build and the communities that we're trying to preserve in so many parts of the country. And we've gotten to a, a pace in our development, not only in this region, but nationally, certainly in Boston, where I'm from, and in all the places that I get to work, where there's a lot of fiscal constraints. There's a lot of skepticism over what will work well. And there's a lot of change. Change is the only constant in anything we deal with. Change is absolutely inevitable. And one thing I have learned is that areas that do not plan well for change, do not anticipate change, and sometimes do not try to seize the change, do languish for sure. Uh, I'm impressed when I get to work in the middle parts of the country and see some absolutely unbelievable, as though they were based on the coasts, changes in downtowns with transportation and with transit. And I'll talk about a couple of those places here tonight. But where successes have happened, it's happened because people have gotten together. And so it's good that you might have a discussion out of this, not only tonight, but in the near future. And that you should try to extend that discussion as much as possible to other constituents you work with. One of the, the basic points of multimodal transportation is everything about efficiency. But I'm not actually going to talk to this very much tonight. I think this is somewhat of a given for most people. You can put more people on a train or on a bus, even on bikes, and certainly walking than you can in a car. But do we need to invest in the things that make that work very well? I do think it's important to talk a little bit tonight about how our communities in particular here in southern New Hampshire, are ready or not from the land use perspective. And that's really an essential part of this, which is that you can never plan a transportation system without thinking about where people live, work, go, play, exercise, you name it. And that's really fundamental to getting folks around. And I'm sorry, I wish this graphic were a little bit clearer, but it's really just a guide. There's no rule that says do anything or certain levels of density, five units an acre, 10, 20, 30 units an acre, or 15 employees an acre, 20, 25, or 50. But just for perspective, Nashua and Manchester are already well past a couple of these bars, and in fact, are right on line with at least one of the examples I'm gonna talk about today, but others around the country who have done an amazing implementation of transit in their communities. And this is just overall densities in these regions. The truth is that really you're gonna be serving four areas where density is strongest. And the density, for instance, of downtown Nashua is way up over here. So to think about the places you're gonna serve does mean thinking about downtowns, does mean thinking about the places in the hearts where communities ultimately benefit from transportation investments and the right land use choices. That's ultimately the third tier here that I think is most important to talk about tonight. Because getting great transportation service and figuring out the right kind of land use mix, in the end, can only be supported by the right kind of access, the right kind of think about the design of the place to be able to benefit your community. Now, I, I live in a relatively urban place, but for metropolitan Boston, it's not by far the densest place. It's, it's Davis Square in Somerville, and these are just some images of the square. What's interesting is the square had been 
really just another New England square. And even today, most buildings are no more than two or three stories high until this came in. But when this came in, in the mid 80s, there was a lot of resistance locally to what the MBTA and the region wanted to put in. They wanted to put in parking garage, a lot of development, and Somerville said no. We want this on our terms. We want to respect what our community is, and we want to be able to continue to roll in on the bus, and we want to continue to be able to walk in on our bike paths, and emphasized a level of development that was not much more than was already there. It really didn't change dramatically. But by doing so, not only did it completely change the economic future of Davis Square, and over the years, it's helped Somerville, but that became one of the highest boarding stations in the entire MBTA system, other than the major hubs in downtown. Everybody was walking to that station. They were arriving by bus and by bike. This data actually, I think, is, is a little bit out of date. It's even better now in those, in those percentages. Very few people got dropped off by car, and they weren't focused on parking. The parking solution is a traditional solution. And it's the thing that says, well, how am I going to get to the train? <clears throat> Most people don't get to the train by driving to the train. And yet, this is Alewife Station at the end of the same red line in the 80s when they built it. And it was heavily focused on driving to and getting on over 2,000 parking spaces at this massive multimodal center. And while this may be some level of transit development, we don't like to think of it as classic transit-oriented development, because this is not a pretty picture that occurs every day, twice a day, for at least an hour. And then the rest of the time, it is just a barren wasteland. This station that for years had lots of crime problems around it, at the butt end of Cambridge, so to speak, actually had less boardings, even though it was supposed to be the primary station. The key takeaway from this, in a more urban environment than most of southern New Hampshire is, is simply that investing in a different form, thinking about transit-oriented development, is what Cambridge is learning and regions around the country are learning, because now that station does have more boardings than Davis Square does, because they built nearly 3,000 housing units with another 3,000 in the pipeline. Because they changed the entire nature of that district and they're helping them to try to plan out how it could avoid this. Because the presumption that we need transit to get away from this is certainly a good one. But we are often tied to the expectation that we need to continue to provide as much of this as possible and in fact increase it in order to get to our transit stations. Don't. There's a basic fundamental flaw in how we look at traffic, or at least how the profession has looked at traffic for decades. Firms like mine try to say differently. But every textbook in every university course still looks at traffic the same way. Not as an economist. Because if I were to look at traffic and the ebb and flow of people driving or coming into the Alewife station, for instance, through the morning they hit, they come and leave in the evening again, and they cause congestion at those AM and PM peaks across the hours of the day. If that's really my capacity of the roadway system as it is next to Alewife on the Alewife Brook Parkway, routes 2 and 16, that failure right there makes everybody go into a tizzy makes everybody decide that they need to build more highways. And all of this opportunity is lost. Now, Cambridge is reinvesting in terms of development that is transit-oriented, so there will be more driving and activity in this waste. And they want to try to encourage less regional trips into Alewife, which means folks like you need to think about other ways of getting into Boston if any of you happen to drive to Alewife to get into Boston. The methods of treating traffic like a letter grade system are still 100% tried into traffic engineering. And like so many other things that we're afraid to change due to tort reform, should be thrown out. Why? Because it basically says that if you do anything slightly wrong, you wind up with this kind of a letter grade and you've got to fix it. As though this is bad. But the tragedy of a community is that this thing right here scores an A. This is a level of service A. This is a great, great, 
great abandoned stretch of asphalt. And this one, in the heart of your community that's supposed to feed your businesses, is a failure. And if you're going to bring anything into your community, you've got to avoid this. These are bad things. You're getting an F score for doing this kind of stuff. So communities that I'll talk about have had a little bit of faith and recognize that it's more than just moving cars, silly. It's about what people might really expect. That this is awesome. Maybe not always enough, but a couple times a day can possibly be a really, really good thing. And yet we follow the books. I love these kinds of images. This is one by Dan Burton. If you've ever seen the guy <laughs> show his picture shows, they're wonderful. Because there's the person right there in the middle. There's one lone pedestrian on this entire streetscape. And we've got those roads here in New Hampshire. And they shouldn't have been built that way. But we built them because we had congestion. Congestion stinks. Nobody wants congestion, even if it's only for 45 minutes a day. So why don't we widen 993? What a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> well, now, guess what? We can get to Boston faster. Oh, well, oh, yeah, I guess it's true. There will be more people driving, and that may make me unhappy again. This cycle is what, of course, yeah, <laughs> induced demand is all about, but it is what we need to break, and there's plenty of smart tools out there. Think of the alternative tools. Think of the alternative measures. Recognize the reality of the demographics of the United States which is that as we've grown and we continue to drive, something significant began to happen in about 2000. This thing invaded the lives of our children. I'm actually a little bit older than I look. <laughs> <laughs> and this really has changed socializing. The rates of getting driver's licenses have plummeted. The baby boomers, echo boomers, as they're calling them now, are returning to cities. You can pick up a ride right here. I arrive in a zip car. I don't need to worry about my car. I don't need to worry about the traditional things that we always need to worry about. And that people are driving less on a per capita basis is a continued and sustained trend. And yet we build these things. So this is a nice little story. Salem's train station is. 28 minutes from downtown Boston versus 43 minutes driving. It is less than half the price of driving and parking in downtown Boston. No question that you should board that train. The MBTA's data, this is the boardings for a variety of their bigger stations, and then the other bars are their occupied parking spaces. The MBTA's data said, look, Salem and Beverly are among our highest boarding stations, there's like six times as many people boarding those trains as there are people parking in those garages. I said, it's a good thing. And they said, well, that must be a broken thing. And we need to build more parking. So they went out and had this thing built in the middle of a parking site that determined there was 1,500 empty spaces already, but whatever, it was a political promise, and oh, this is going to stimulate development. This thing is still not half full. Here's <laughs> Beverly's garage. It's only a third full. Neither of them is going to get full until maybe the lesson that Haverhill learned, another line that's heading up towards Nashua, when they built this garage, the MVRTA did, and not a soul parked in it. Except luckily they were doing a parking study and finally realized for the first time in 50 years that Haverhill was going to price its parking in downtown. It actually drove people into the parking garage. But the point for doing that was not to get people into the parking garage. The point for doing that was they were worried about the opportunity and the access in the downtown. They were worried about people getting to the businesses that were cropping up and were vital to the downtown. They weren't focused on the solution of building out of their downtown. They were focused on managing their downtown smartly. And these are just some of the comments that people said, thank God you priced my parking for the first time in 50 years, because I can get in. Because it's the small things about managing what we have that wind up having much bigger bang for the buck. Nashua has started to experiment in the exact same thing. 
from what I understand, fairly successfully as well. Because downtowns in New England, because we have so many cool ones at half of these communities around the table, do not function like this. It is not a bunch of different uses with their own parking lots that we drive in and out of, creating all these little turning movements on the strip. But that's what we like to create on so many roads throughout America. In fact, downtowns usually have a mix of parking, and we can just drive in and out and walk between uses. And we can experience the downtown. And that's exactly what a place like Haverhill leverage, just through a simple thing like parking pricing, or other communities have leveraged by not building parking at all in the downtown, and recognizing that there was already existing resources, and that focusing on all the other uses was really the end game, because that actually cuts down on the land areas that impact their downtown, as well as the traffic. And then, of course, if it's real transit-oriented development, and there's a train coming in, and people are living and working nearby, this has no car trips. And that's ultimately where a lot of the millennials, a lot of the echo boomers, are thinking about. They're thinking about beautiful communities where they can do just this. I've interviewed like 20 year olds in random places in the coldest corners of Canada who didn't own a car. Living in places like Kitchener, who you've never heard of, that love it because they can just walk back and forth and once in a while take the bus to get into Toronto. I mean, why? Why? Because they take care of their lives on those cell phones. They like the place that's around them. And then when I'm a planner and I think of they want to go to the restaurant, there's a lot of rent in this little surface area, 25 square feet that could fit four people on a table or so. And, and maybe I want jobs. You know, an office cubicle is about 72 square feet of, of land area. And if we're worried about affordable housing in our downtowns, they, you know, I could sleep one or two people in that space. And I can collect good rents in my downtowns on this. And I never collect rents on something like this. And the focus on creating too much of the wrong thing, the automobile access, is what can really hurt economic development. And it can take away from opportunities, real opportunities, to invest in the kinds of communities that we want. So this is an old idea. The new idea of park and ride is parking and riding your bicycle, or bringing it on the train with you, or recognizing that your downtown can behave in a really exciting and electrifying way. In the end, and I'm going to talk about Portland, Oregon in a second, in the end, your downtowns, your communities, need to think about this guy. Because nothing that we plan now is going to be on the ground before he's able to either drive or take the train. So if we're thinking about doing anything from this day forward, how he gets around in his downtown is incredibly important. And it doesn't matter where you go. This happens to be well-documented data in New York. But everywhere you go, Focusing on bicycle safety. I don't care about all the crashes. You should be always thinking about Vision Zero. 50% increase in retail because bicyclists spend more. 71% increase in retail with a bus lane because transit <laughs> riders spend more time in your downtown. These are economic development engines. It's not about moving people. So Portland <coughs> didn't realize this at all at this level of the people in this room. It didn't realize it at all at the level of leadership. They had been building out this system for a long time. Multi-modes of everything, heavy rail, light rail, buses, BRT, tons and tons of miles on all sorts of lines that they had built out over this period of time between 1986 and 2016. Some is pretty cool, sexy, great downtown streetcars. Some of the stuff is really, really, really cheap. In fact, they build their own there. And this whole transit system, look at the geography of this community. Again, it's a pinch more dense than southern New Hampshire. Sprawling with transit lines. What mattered and why did they do that? It was the people thinking about their kids 
in 10 or 15 years. It was the people thinking about what is it that we really value? What is it that we're going to get out of transit? Communities, walking, biking, greenhouse gas reduction, the economy, safety, resource distribution. Is any of that commuting to work? Is any of that getting rid of the car? Is any of that transportation? Other than the idea of access, it's underlying all of this. What drove an investment in transit as well as the creation of their own transit economy? This is the part of the country that decided to and builds their own streetcars, the only ones in America. Because they saw that it was so much better to be investing in rail than to be investing in the bus. As much as the bus was cheaper, as much as they had to bite off more than they thought they could chew and invest in light rail and streetcar technologies, they knew that in the long term it would have a greater benefit to their community. It would have a significantly greater impact on reducing carbon emissions. And it would create the communities that they wanted. Because they had just a few of these little urban transit villages and they saw, wow, I want to be at that station. I want to have that in my downtown. All these communities said, that's what I can have. They had one or two examples, and they exploded from it. And these are still even more modern pictures of what's happening in these communities at the heart of advanced planning, because they really said, look, we're going to focus on the place and getting people to and from the places safely. This is the type of infrastructure, you know, bike and park, not drive and park. Make even the bus stops on the rubber tire vehicles give you some level of respect and information so you know what you're doing and how you're getting around. Make it feel like a place when you're getting on a train. Even bring the train into a place. And think about that integration. That kind of approach has driven the entire Portland Metro system expansion policy. It's all about, you know, it's always about the five Ds. No, for them it's the six Ps mostly centered on people. And this is literally how an agency expands its transit. It's not a story that just happens in Portland. Denver is not a very dense city. Los Angeles is a very sprawled city. They've had massive, unbelievable transit investment in the last five years, like you would not believe. But some of the best places that are taking advantage of this are the small communities. Boulder is doing it all with the bus and one commuter rail line. Like this is a such a story of people cramming on to 30 footers to get into downtown because that's that much better, faster, and more cost effective than bothering to build more parking. Or Eugene, Oregon, an area that is just woods and sprawl. It is a little bit denser in their center city than say for instance Manchester. And they've put in one of the best bus rapid transit lines in the entire country. So, and I, just to wrap, and I, I want to get into a conversation with all of you, you're going to have a lot of these opportunities down the road, and you've got three potentially great rail corridors to be thinking about. Um, not only the one that works well in the east, but maybe enhancing it, but of course the central corridor, and maybe even the knowledge corridor. The changes that can happen are not about park and ride lines. You know, I, I go down to the, the park and ride lot that's, um, well, there's a couple of them. I passed one on Route 3, there's another one on 93, and it's great. I love riding Concord Coach in and out to be able to get out. Those are, are nodes where things can happen and where change can happen. And if you focus more on what the places can be as we get going, and you create your own pretty visuals, your own kind of inspiring economic development story about transit, that's what wins. 